The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost, it's lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. He was gonna, he wanted to, he tried to, and now we'll impeach him for it. Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. After three days of impeachment theater this week, Democrats appear set to issue articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump. It's a decision they made before these hearings even began, one suspects, because they've laid their entire political fortunes at the feet of an agenda with just two items, impeachment from the elected class and socialism from the Democrats trying to unseat President Trump. And all of it was on display on Capitol Hill and in the Democrats' midweek debate. We'll break this all down from multiple angles with some fresh perspective you won't get anywhere else as we're joined by LibertyNation.com political columnist Joe Schaefer plus Liberty Nation legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza joins us to discuss a major story on marijuana, a bill in the House of Representatives to legalize it across the nation. He was gonna He wanted to. He tried to. After ravenous Democrats were let down big time when the entire Russia collusion hoax blew up in their faces, they resorted to three now familiar tactics which were replayed almost exactly during the three days of impeachment theater on display this week on Capitol Hill. Number one, a crime of desire. Number two, obstruction Number three, more charges. Put another way, a thought crime, obstruction, more charges. Here's what I mean. After Robert Mueller appeared before that House committee and flopped big time, failing to even recollect what was in his own report, Democrats wound up calling for Trump's impeachment anyway, not because of the entire purpose of the Mueller investigation, collusion, but because they found out that he wanted to fire Mueller at one point. So they said that was grounds for impeachment, that Trump wanted to fire Mueller, that Trump thought of firing Mueller, even at one point ordered that Mueller be fired. But Mueller was not fired. Didn't matter to the Democrats. This time around, the crime of desire or thought crime was to extract an investigation into widespread corruption in Ukraine, including that country's own attempts to influence the 2016 election by digging up dirt on Trump's campaign manager Paul Manafort and issuing public statements condemning Donald Trump. Trump tried to extract an investigation into flagrant and widespread corruption in return for military aid, aid that had been denied by Barack Obama and consistent with Trump's famously demanding posture at the negotiating table. But there was no investigation, and the aid was delivered. Doesn't matter to the Democrats. Maybe the only thing Trump should be faulted for is backing down from his demand for that investigation since the corruption stretching from Biden and his son and the millions in ill-gotten gains and the firing of the investigator examining Hunter Biden's company, which everybody knew was corrupt, all the way to the previous regime, which nakedly condemned and undermined Trump during the 2016 campaign. Maybe he shouldn't have backed down from 
demanding an investigation into all of that. But there it is. The crime of desire, impeachable offenses for wanting to fire Mueller, for wanting an investigation into obvious corruption in return for hundreds of millions in foreign aid. Then there's the thing that has replaced patriotism as the last refuge of scoundrels. Obstruction. Obstruction of justice. When the Democrats laid an egg with Russia collusion, they fell back on obstruction, one of the easiest charges to make. All you do is call some peripheral witness who's covered by executive privilege, who you know is never going to testify, especially on an explosive subject. And then when he refuses to testify, you cry obstruction. And now Adam Schiff and company are doing the same thing with the Ukraine business with credible record, uh, reports indicating obstruction will, of course, be one of supposedly four articles of impeachment soon to be introduced by the Democrats. And then there's more charges, the third familiar tactic of the Democrats. These people appear incapable of shame. They wanted to impeach Trump for Russia collusion, of course. But remember before that, they wanted him impeached for firing Comey, for Stormy Daniels, for Michael Avenatti, for Michael Cohen, for the Emoluments Clause, for the 25th Amendment, for wanting to fire Mueller, now for wanting to get an investigation in return for military aid. Rest assured, no matter the outcome, the Democrats will find more impeachable offenses between now and Election Day 2020. They must. They have to. Because it's all they've got. Impeachment in the elected class and socialism in their candidates running for president who gathered together for a fifth debate this week. They talked about impeachment, but not for long as they quickly returned to their familiar themes of more government, more taxes, more social justice and the rest. And we'll return to discuss the Democrats' two-headed monster impeachment and socialism with LibertyNation.com political columnist Joe Schaefer in just a moment. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Where can you find honest political commentary with sobering analysis, accountability, deconstructing threats to our liberty, and boldly reporting the truth? Subscribe to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel, where facts matter. that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. You need only to have paid attention for the excruciating, exhausting, emotionally draining 24 hours of Wednesday, November 20th, 2019 to understand all you really need to know about today's Democratic Party. A two-headed monster reared its head first in the light of day and then after dark, in a memorably horrific reminder of what has become of one of our two major political parties. The two heads are impeachment and socialism. And here to discuss what the Democrats have become is LibertyNation.com's outspoken political columnist, Joe Schaefer. Welcome, Joe. Uh, thanks, Tim. That was a heck of an introduction. I think uh, we don't even need to talk. I think you captured it all right there. Well, nevertheless, let's start with impeachment. Democrats have relied on second and third and fourth hand witnesses in this impeachment. Will that kind of evidence be persuasive when it goes to a trial in the Senate uh, to no. convict to convict and remove the president from office? No, not at all. It, it, it's, it sounds weak. Uh, it, it sounds like, you know, when you said you paired it with how, how lame the debate is, they are, Democrats are dominating a 24-hour news cycle now, and they have nothing of substance to offer, either on impeachment or when they're debating each other at night. 
uh, you know, they bring these finely dressed career diplomats who are obviously hostile to Trump. It's what Trump ran against. You're not hurting him bringing these guys out. And you have someone like Gordon Sondland, who is the ambassador to the European Union, saying everybody's in the loop. And then he's not really saying anything that shows he's deep in the loop. Oh, I said something and Mike Pence nodded at me. You know, you're not you're not convicting anybody in a court of law with, with that. And it really doesn't sound like you're uh, cl close to the president's ear when you're saying things like that. So but the Democrats jump all over it. Oh, in the loop, in the loop. We got him here. And it's just a circus and it just keeps going on. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of opinions, a lot of feelings, a lot of defense of traditional foreign policy guidelines and strictures that have stood for 75 years since the Cold War. So there's a tremendous resistance to a guy like Trump who comes in and basically proposes to break the furniture. That's what he was elected to do. But now he sees just how difficult a job it really is. Now, here's something I don't understand, Joe, that no one seems to be talking about. If Donald Trump is a Russian agent, as the left still contends, why would he be providing the very kind of lethal aid to a country invaded by Russia that Barack Obama, by the way, refused to provide? Yeah, I mean, it makes no sense at all on the surface. Apparently, that doesn't stop the Democrats from proceeding with this. Uh, if you want to try to orchestrate a coup against the president, you got to go for, with some corrupt people. And the corruption is in Ukraine nowadays. And I'm talking about U.S. corruption, people who have a vested financial interest in propping up the Cold War, which ended oh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, you know, Hunter Biden making all his money there. They don't want that investment. Investigated. Uh, and so, you know, you get these people who, frankly, to me, are a bit unsavory. I don't care what, you know, what uniform they show up in for their congressional testimony. They look shady to me. And, you know, those are the people who are in Ukraine now. Uh, it's, it's just a big financial windfall for people who do not have the interests of the American people at heart. So let's see if I can follow this. The, all the star witnesses that the Democrats brought forward went on to imply in one form or another that there was an improper transaction between Trump uh, and Zelensky. They're adamant about it. And yet, when it comes down, you know what? I, I lost my train of thought. I forget. I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sure it was a brilliant point. <laughs> Will you stipulate that, Joe? It's a, it was going to be a brilliant point. It really brilliant. Was. brilliant. Okay, let's, uh, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Uh, is that the country? I right, never mind. Let's go. Okay, Joe, so let's move on to the debate on Wednesday night. Did you find it curious how the Democrats' presidential candidates didn't spend a whole lot of time discussing impeachment, which should have been almost the only topic of discussion if it's really as important as Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff say it is. Well, it's a telling point that it's not a political winner in their in their minds. So maybe, you know, people should start thinking, why are Democrats doing this? Then? Yes, they want to get rid of Trump. I think a strong argument could be made is that they're trying to go on the offensive so they don't have investigations coming out against them. You know, there's a Russia, you know, people have been investigating that Russia probe that was a fiasco. And there are a lot of people that are gonna end up looking very, very bad with that. How do you get people to stop thinking about that? Impeach, 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 even if it doesn't make sense. The Democratic candidates, there's not a lot to talk about here because it's not a convincing uh, argument. So they are best avoiding it. I found it very interesting last night how conventional on foreign policy so many of the Democrats were. And Tulsi Gabbard brought that up again and boy, they really don't like her. And the only reason they don't like her is she's not a neocon. I mean, the Democratic Party seems to be willingly allowing itself to be hijacked by neocons on foreign policy. And Kamala Harris took a gratuitous swipe at Tulsi Gabbard for no reason. I mean, talk about punching down. But then Kamala Harris has been in a death spiral for months and she's clinging to anything and not clinging very successfully. That's quite obvious. Now, Joe Biden who looked, I thought, old and tired and spent. He 
somehow felt it appropriate to trumpet the idea that he was at the center of this whole Ukraine imbroglio, that <laughs> him and his son and the $83,000 a month of millions that he got from Ukraine, <laughs> somehow he felt it would help him to bring this up. What do you think he could possibly have been thinking? I think his mind is just uh, unfocused right now. He just kind of shoots from the hip. He wanted to portray it as there is a grand conspiracy to keep me from being elected because Vladimir Putin doesn't want me in the White House. And I don't know why he thinks that's a great argument. I don't understand most of his arguments. He, he, he really stretched to try to bring an obscure Senator, Carol Mosley Braun, into the conversation. And he ended up botching that completely. And, you know, not only did it look like he was pandering for black voters, but he was pandering by going back 15 years or so, again, showing he lives in the past. He's not living in 2019, and he really doesn't have anything to offer for 2020. And the more he keeps saying these things, the more he's telling the American people that uh, he's, he's, his candidacy is, is so done. He's so done. He's done. John, I want to close by bringing up something you wrote to me earlier today, which I thought was quite intriguing. You said this business with impeachment, this in business with socialism and Medicare for all and the Green New Deal and all these programs that would bankrupt the economy basically means like getting rid of the economy and starting over. You said all of this makes the Democrats appear smaller to the American people and they can't even see it. Expound on that thought, if you would. Well, I, I was talking about their, their far-fetched policies, um, but really the, the, the two-headed monster that you talked about with impeachment and then the boring debate, where they just keep saying all the things they've been saying all along, uh, and they're not really offering the American people anything new and exciting. The more you talk about nothing, the more, you know, it's going to diminish you in the eyes of the people. And this is what they're doing with these, with, with, with the impeachment. It, the longer it goes on and the, and the more they hype it up and then it becomes a big nothing burger, that diminishes you. And when you go on a debate stage and you argue about the same things you've been arguing about for seven months now, I mean, they have to, they have to start casting votes. They have to cast some votes and get some people out of this race. And yet we have two more people in the race now, but Bloomberg's it's not official, but he is all but official. And all of that makes them look small. All of that makes them look small. They need to either say something decisive, challenge the, the ruling progressive party orthodoxy, vote or something, but don't just keep regurgitating this meaningless garbage that you've been talking about for seven months. Let's, let's move on to some substance. And again, on the other hand, uh, Joe, when Tulsi Gabbard tried to do that, where did it get her? On that note, Joe, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. That is Joe Schaefer, political columnist for LibertyNation.com. And we'll return to drill down further on how one day this week revealed all you need to know about the wayward state of the Democratic Party circa 2019. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours, the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. So we've been discussing a fateful day this week, a day that proved fully revelatory for those not previously paying attention to the Democrats' three-year impeachment crusade Wednesday this week, November 20th when the Democrats fully unmasked themselves with their two-headed monster of an agenda, impeachment, and socialism. 
the Democrats' breathtaking contempt for the unwashed, deplorable masses, their disdain for the will of regular workaday Americans was on vivid 4K display as they proceeded to punish the deplorables who voted in unacceptable fashion. First, with the attempted removal of the president they elected, and then by proposing to topple and transform the nation they voted to restore. Indeed, in the space of a mere 24 hours this past Wednesday, the Democrats fully unmasked themselves and revealed a remarkably simple and equally frightening agenda to place before the American people in the 2020 elections. Impeachment and socialism. Impeachment and socialism. Now, after testimony by a rogues gallery of diplomatic and political witnesses, the particular testimony of EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland was most breathlessly trumpeted by the full array of Democratic cheerleaders in the elite media as the latest grave threat to Trump. Like the other witnesses produced by the majority, it initially appeared to the naked eye that Sondland's qualified accusation of a quid pro quo made things look more bleak for the president. And yet Sondland's testimony and his credibility began to disintegrate as the day progressed, and there were so many contradictions in what he said and others said. So, as his credibility began to disintegrate, so did the Democrats' chances of convincing even a single Republican to support impeachment. Now, in fact, beyond... Even the fact of zero Republican support, proof of the Democrats' own realization that there's no chance Trump will be convicted and removed from office, was Schiff's opening statement on that Wednesday when he headlined the same charge used in the wake of the failed Russia collusion hoax. Obstruction. Schiff knows full well that there was no crime in Trump's actions, only political fodder for the voters to evaluate. You bring it up as a campaign issue. What happened with Ukraine? You let the voters decide. But not Schiff. He instead is forced to claim obstruction of justice. Of course, that was after the Democrats convened focus groups to determine what accusation would increase the political resonance of a process the American people have just tuned out. They're not watching. Their bottom line is no interest, no interest, no interest. TV ratings were flat at best, lower than the Comey hearings, lower than the Michael Cohen hearing. So they dropped the term quid pro quo and went straight to bribery, apparently concluding that even the term extortion is insufficiently sensational. Now, nowhere in this process... Has anyone bothered to view this transaction by Trump and Zelensky through the lens of who Trump is and how he operates? As a businessman extraordinaire, he famously prides himself on the art of the deal. He negotiates everything, tries to squeeze the last ounce of blood from across the table, unwilling to settle for the safe victory that would satisfy most conventional politicians. He was willing to provide the anti-tank javelins, which President Obama was unwilling to supply, but wanted Zelensky to do the right thing, as he told Sondland. As in all negotiations, both sides give and take. But Trump ultimately provided exactly what was promised, even as his negotiating conditions were not met. Hello, this is how every bit of foreign aid has always been provided, with conditions. Does anyone believe the many beneficiaries of America's largesse receive a blank check? Trump is simply more bold, more demanding. He refuses to work off the State Department and intelligence community script. And who can blame him? These are the same people who've collaborated to weaken, even cripple his presidency from the inside, from the jump. Trump's irregular channel is based on his deep, well-earned distrust of the permanent Washington bureaucracy. 
This impeachment theater has revealed that the Democrats, even the Democrats, agree that Ukraine has long been one of the most corrupt nations on earth. And the government in place before Zelensky was overtly anti-Trump during the 2016 campaign, dredging up dirt on Trump's campaign manager, making inflammatory anti-Trump statements publicly. How is it illegitimate to demand an investigation of not just historically widespread corruption in that nation, but the obvious issue of the former vice president's son getting millions of dollars and a board seat on the country's largest energy energy concern for which he had no qualifications, none. And then the prosecutor investigating that company was fired at the behest of, wait for it, Vice President Biden. And there's no reason to investigate, really? Media attention has conveniently and effectively focused on Biden, the 2020 candidate and opponent of Trump, and ignored Biden as Obama's point man on Ukraine. And oh, by the way, if Trump is a Russian agent, a notion still embraced by Trump deranged leftists, why in heaven's name would he be providing lethal aid to a nation attacked by Russia? Obama's pronounced denial of that aid was paired with a promise to defend Ukraine if Russia invaded. But but that defense was never provided as the Russians overran and annexed Crimea and then moved on the remainder of Ukraine. Does anybody actually believe Ukraine is not better off now than under Obama? None of the Democrats' star witnesses this week dared make such a claim even under Intense questioning. Here's another question. If Trump was breaking some law, why would he demand a public announcement of an investigation by the Ukrainian president? If things weren't on the level, he would have tried to get it done quietly or even secretly. But no, he wanted the whole world to know that Ukraine had changed its corrupt ways and agreed to, in Trump's words, do the right thing. Now, in the category of stuff you couldn't make up, how about that uniformed officer and native Ukrainian presented as another star witness for the Democrats, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who revealed that he had on more than one occasion been offered the position of defense minister for Ukraine. Seriously, (laughs) is this not particularly creepy? A high-ranking American military officer being recruited to head Ukrainian defenses? Vindman most perfectly betrayed the entitled mindset of the encrusted foreign policy establishment when he deemed Trump's investigation demand as unacceptable, as if it was up to him to decide. NSC official Fiona Hill followed on Thursday by saying, our highly professional and expert career foreign service is being undermined. Vindman and Hill are part and parcel of an unelected foreign policy and intelligence establishment filled with lifers who truly believe they, not the elected president, are the repositories of wisdom. They, not the elected president, are the ones who know best. And they, not the elected president, should be deciding what America's foreign policy ought to be. Now, when they... Wednesday finally unmercifully turned from day to night. The show moved from Capitol Hill to Atlanta, where Elizabeth Warren kicked off the socialist portion of the Democrats' agenda with another one of her famous plans. But this time it was one which might actually draw widespread praise. On the heels of Sondland's testimony, the on-again, off-again frontrunner, Focahontas, declared that she plans to discontinue the tradition of awarding ambassadorships to major donors. Good for her. Unfortunately, the show then quickly descended into another all-too-predictable spectacle, hatred of Trump, love of government. Young Pete Buttigieg's latest frontrunner in the initial contest in Iowa asserted that impeachment, the very definition of a political process, should be beyond politics. Kamala Harris, in a death spiral for months now, labeled the Trump administration a criminal enterprise and pledged 
to force employers to provide six months paid family leave. Amy Klobuchar called for a a constitutional amendment to overturn a Supreme Court case, Citizens United. Yeah, I'm confused, too. Bernie Sanders demanded the prosecution of energy company executives and up the ante, or did he lower it, by declaring that the lifespan of the earth as we know it, 12 years according to AOC earlier this year, has now months later been reduced to eight years, maybe nine. Semi-frontrunner Joe Biden looked burned out, clueless, running on empty, inexplicably raising the issue of his centrality to this Ukraine imbroglio as if that somehow advantages him, and then resorting to empty talk about his electability and embarrassingly affected bravado. The remaining candidates like entrepreneur Andrew Yang and billionaire Tom Steyer left not a single footprint in the sand. Tulsi Gabbard was gratuitously attacked, though, by Kamala Harris for daring to oppose our involvement in Syria and foreign involvements generally, cementing the Democrats' newfound and inexplicable posture as the party of war. In a day designed to stir the blood of the party's rabid dog base, the Democrats managed to scare off the very voters they will need to win back the White House. And they seem not even to realize it. Indeed, it was the crushing losses in the heartland that sunk Hillary Clinton in 2016, and the Democrats' response is impeachment and socialism. Do they actually believe reversing the outcome of a presidential election and tearing down the foundations of a free market economy will appeal to the disaffected millions who abandoned them the last time around? The voters will surely ask themselves what the Democrats have accomplished with the majority granted to them in the House of Representatives last year. They campaigned on a legislative agenda which included working with the president on the pressing issues of prescription drug prices, infrastructure, and even health care. But other than a long-forgotten bill to tweak the criminal justice system, they have fulfilled none of their promises. Meanwhile, the president has delivered on the most significant of all his promises, a robust economy, millions of new jobs, Record low unemployment and peace. Yes, peace and prosperity are no longer promises, but facts. Which record do you think the voters will prefer? Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And now we welcome you to the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitle Talkin' Liberty. It is self-explanatory, of course, as is our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, or as I like to call him, our guardian of liberty, guardian of individual Liberty Scott Cosenza. Hello, Scott. I love that title, Tim. Hello. Thank you. I keep adding on gratuitous <laughs> it's, things it's, to your it title. Makes, it makes me feel so nice. To a title that's already too long to no, encompass no. Uh, within the frame of an entire segment of a radio show. But let's jump right in because this is really big stuff. We've been talking about for months, if not years, the problem with the federal law on marijuana and various state laws, which are not in conformity with each other. And now a key committee in Congress has approved a marijuana legalization bill. Take it from there. I find it endlessly fascinating, Tim, because in my lifetime, uh, as a sort of aware, policy aware person, I've seen marijuana go from being completely prohibited in all 50 states to uh, this, and, and not just prohibited, but in a way that was... Uh, ever forceful and present, the raids, the arrests, the filling of the jails, and the terror in the hearts of the people who wanted to use marijuana. And now it's it's in such in full retreat. We have, Tim, for the first time, uh, a major step in federal legislation. We have had the, the Cole Memo, of, which has previously allowed uh, people to use and sell marijuana at the state level without 
uh, suffering from federal prosecution uh, if if they were lucky and, the, and and that memo was stayed in force. We've had some back and forth we've dis- discussed on this show about that. But now we have the Congress moving in a big way, Tim, the first major uh, – passage out of committee of federal marijuana decriminalization across the board and also retroactively uh, uh, basically removing the convictions and some of the penalties from those convictions. Let me just step in for a second and ask you here the distinction between decriminalization and legalization. Which one is this and which one is this not? Well, it's uh, partly decriminalization and partly legalization, okay. I think, is the answer. You sound, you sound like a politician. Right. Well, yeah, <laughs> sad yeah, to say. Yeah. Well, politicians right. are the ones who wrote it. Of okay. course. Thank you. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. Perfect. The, uh, so typically, I think when people say uh, decriminalization, they just mean removal of the criminal prohibitions. And so those people, like I am, Tim, a libertarian, don't want to see large uh, uh, sort of regimes of regulation. And, and for instance, in the Marijuana Opportunity and Reinvestment and Expungement Act that we're talking about that passed the uh, through the Judiciary Committee, there are like small business administration loans that are opened up. There's a couple funds that are like they tax marijuana at 5% for certain products to fund like the community, you know, fund. that's the kind of stuff where it's like, no, 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 just take away the prohibitions and then let people be free to do what they wish. So the decriminalization is the removing from marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act. That's what this does, and that's what will allow it to then you know, be penalty-free from a federal law perspective. So how far down the road are we based on this? And, okay, based on this, what, what, what appear to be the chances that this would pass the House and then pass muster in the Senate? Um, and how much... How far down the road does this take it to reconciling federal law with state law? Uh, If passed in its current form, I think the answer to your second question is fully reconciled. States will be able to to have their distribution grow, distribution sales uh, rubriced, and and be in compliance with federal law, which, again— You know, Tim, we have to pause and remind everybody that every single marijuana store that's operating in America where marijuana is, quote unquote, legal is, in fact, operating in violation of federal law. Every farm, every grow up, every person who goes and buys and consumes one joint is doing so in violation of federal law, which is why it's so important, given the fact that the the people have voted, they want the weed. We need to to change the federal law Um, to the first question, which is sort of how far down, you know, uh, is this going to happen, I guess, was the question. Right. Um, This is a, a, a bipartisan supported legislation, Tim, but but more heavily supported on the Democrat side and more lightly supported on the Republican side. So I could see it getting through the House. It got through this committee. Um, whether it is able to get through uh, the Senate is uh, a question I don't uh, really – I don't have a crystal ball for that one. That will put the, the Senate on the spot because if you have bipartisan passage in the House, there's pressure for the same thing in the Senate. And all you'd need to get on top of 47 Democrats would be – what you'd need four uh, Republicans and you'd need no veto from the president. Yeah. So he has been uh, generally uh, libertarian about ish. Well, libertarian. We, <laughs> ish. I mean, on the if you had to say the scale, he leans more that direction. It seems think, so. But I think he doesn't care. The, the, the sense I get from Trump is that this is not an issue for him. It seems like a populist yeah. Uh, yeah. response to me. He, mm-hmm. he will go where the people seem to be, I think. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcast, The Uprising, hosted by Scott and Politics and Prose otherwise known as the rabbit hole, where past is prologue. All of them available for you on demand at LibertyNation.com. So that is it for this week, but we will be back at you next week, same time, same station. In the meantime, a happy and blessed Thanksgiving to you. Remember to stand up for liberty, especially at the Thanksgiving table. This is Tim Donner. See you next time.